everybody. We are the Class Acts and this is our group decision and process video. The provocative statement that we decided to go with for this project was that the U.S. federal government should create comprehensive hate speech laws. We began this project by forming three research questions regarding our provocative statement in order to further explore the topic. The first question we asked was, what laws does the U.S. currently have regarding speech and hate speech? This was important to determine how much of an issue the problem was and establish how it could be fixed, either simply by making a law or requiring laws to be rewritten. Then we asked, would new hate speech laws require changing the First Amendment, and if so, how are changes made to the U.S. Constitution amendments? It would be important to acknowledge whether or not hate speech laws would require changing the amendments. Finally, how would the government regulate speech with social media and the Internet? This question is very important in our society today, as it is unusual for someone to not be active on the Internet. We were able to create a total of nine arguments or perspectives in regards to our provocative statement. However, there were five that really stood out and seemed to be the most important. The five perspectives also seemed the most relevant. The first perspective was that there is a particular process that colleges and universities should follow when addressing the problem of hate speech on campus and managing the First Amendment. There must be a comprehensive approach to the issue. It must encourage dialogue in the community. It must encompass non-regulatory as well as regulatory options. Options. It must be adapted for the particular circumstances of the college or university, and it must focus on First Amendment issues as to avoid legal problems. Because we are all currently university students, this argument seems to be the most relevant to us. There were many strong sources that supported this perspective, including some academic sources. We found four different sources to back up this argument, and one journal by William Kaplan suggested that the process by which colleges and universities deal with hate speech is going to be the key to successfully dealing with the issue while not overstepping or conflicting with the First Amendment. Another source written by Evan Siegel suggested that administrators of those colleges and universities are increasingly being challenged with how to address hate speech. This argument is specifically directed at colleges and universities and does not require the input of the government or the creation of any new government laws. As a team, we would like to know how the majority of campuses in the state are addressing hate speech issues and if anything works better for addressing hate speech within colleges and universities. Perspective opposed the idea that comprehensive hate speech laws should be made, which made it unique and important to look into. The U.S. government should not create comprehensive hate speech laws because it conflicts with the U.S. Constitution and would create more problems than solutions. This perspective also had a number of sources that helped to form this perspective. Our first source that provided insight into this argument was written by Suzanne Nossel. Nossel argues that there are already laws in place, so it would be futile to create more. Another article by Larissa Ludzki argues that laws would not prevent hate speech or hateful acts from occurring, and therefore it would be useless to create more laws. Lidsky provides two different examples, including an incident of Terry Jones, where some tweets and a YouTube video led to massive rioting and murder. It is important that Lidsky points this out because no law can prevent a riot from occurring. It can only try to stop it. But there are already laws in place for that. As a team, what we need to know more about is what the Constitution currently says in regards to a hateful speech, and what problems it might create if more laws are created. Another perspective also disagreed, because those who align with this perspective believe hate speech laws give the U.S. government the ability to abuse their power. Hate speech laws will give the government the opportunity to abuse their power, and will do nothing to reduce levels of hate in our country. Governments that have had this power have used it as a weapon, punishing their critics and minority groups. The perspective also uses a variety of sources, including a couple written by Suzanne Nossel. Nossel argues that hate speech laws give the government the ability to abuse power and cites a case in Rwanda. N Nossel discusses a leading politician in Rwanda that is currently serving a 15-year prison sentence for what the government calls divisionalism. But in actuality, the politician had just pointed out that there were Tutsi as well as Hutu victims in the genocide. This type of abuse of power is what, Nassel, what leads Nassel to believe that new hate speech laws would only provide the government with the mechanism to punish those that they choose. Another source written by Zach Greenberg states that governments who currently have hate speech laws, such as Turkey, Pakistan, Germany, and Egypt, have gone on arresting sprees various house raids, and have even sentenced some to death. I'll show the abuse of power of these 
abusive power of these governments. In order to better understand this perspective, we need to, as a team, investigate further into what those governments, such as Rwanda, have in place for laws, and if they are written for, in a way that would allow a government to abuse power. Once we determine this, it would allow us the opportunity to determine if new laws could be written in a way that would not allow the government to abuse power. Building off the previous perspectives that have already been shared, another perspective had a completely different approach. The way to stop hateful speech is to t stop talking about hate speech. Hate speech is a confusing term that does not have a clear meaning. We should continue to fight hateful speech but should retire the term hate speech because it is often misunderstood. This perspective also uses the author Susan Nozzle, and this perspective extends from the idea that there are too many people that misunderstood the term hate speech, so in order to combat it, the term should be retired. <clears throat> this approach is unique in the fact that it allows for the ability to still decide if new comprehensive laws should be created. However, it asks us to take a further look into what hate speech actually is. Nozzle believes that there is no distinction between having a hateful intent and having a helpful intent, and that it is where the hate speech misunderstanding stems from. Nozzle also argues that hate speech is too multidimensional, which also helps feed the fire of misunderstanding. When creating comprehensive hate speech laws, they should not be thought of as hate speech, but rather unlawful speech or speech that is harmful to others. In order for our team to fully understand this perspective, there are some f further questions that we must ask. If we are not to call it hate speech, how would we define this speech and how would we spread this? It also pushes us to ask, is there a true definition for hate speech? Finally, our last perspective looks further into the First Amendment and its inability to cover hate speech as a reason why more comprehensive hate laws need to be made. <clears throat> the First Amendment is too broad and does not cover hate speech from one citizen directed at another. The First Amendment protects the government from critics, but not its citizens and therefore more comprehensive hate speech laws need to be created. The First Amendment is what provides United States citizens with the right to free speech. Among other freedoms, however, many claim that it is, the way, that it is way too broad and does not properly cover citizens from hateful attacks from other citizens. Therefore, this perspective calls for the creation of new comprehensive hate speech laws that would make the First Amendment more defined. Noah Berlatsky <clears throat> discusses this in his article and explains that the First Amendment does a great job at protecting the government from criticism, but it's not its citizens. Berlatsky specifically references how the First Amendment is used to protect the president and other high officials from hate speech, but does little else than this. When someone uses hate speech through social media or other outlets, it does not become unlawful as it is if it is not directed at the president. To completely understand this perspective, our team must gain more understanding of how exactly the government handles hate speech with regards to the First Amendment. So overall, we were able to work really cohesively within our group. Um, communication was really open in our group, which was really nice. Um, starting out, there was a couple complications just with like technical errors. Um, but once we kind of got our, feet, our, like, our route figured out and exactly how we're going to communicate, it went really smoothly. And as leaders, we were all able to allow one another to share opinions, and we each stood up to take charge of different parts of the process, which is kind of nice. We all had the opportunity to kind of be a leader within our small group, and together as a group, we all definitely grew in our ability to work in a group. Um, it's not uncommon, obviously, to have group work in college, however, most tend to avoid it. And the main issue that we ran into while trying to work in a group was that everyone had busy and different schedules. So at the beginning of this project, we tend to cut it like really close to the deadline and we kind of um, didn't really have any, like our workflow figured out, we didn't really know exactly who was going to take charge and what roles we were all going to be in. And so it just, it wasn't very smooth. But now towards the end of this project, we have um, definitely found out how to work more efficiently together, and we have been able to finish our assignments with time to spare. Um, <clears throat> we also found that planning ahead and starting the assignment early definitely helped to get um, the assignment done before the due date. And we also found that someone taking charge to kind of start up the assignment and make the rule 
the roles of each person clear was super helpful. Um, everyone really appreciated when someone was able to send out like a friendly little reminder um, when something needed to get done or when an assignment due date was coming up. Um, as we we're all pretty busy with different aspects of our lives, so sometimes we'd forget about certain due dates. So in that aspect, working in a group was definitely very beneficial to us. And another way it was beneficial was that at some points during the project, we were a little bit unclear of exactly what the directions were saying and what we were supposed to do with the project. So having three other people there to be able to ask, like, okay, so what exactly is this, you know, what does this mean? What are they trying to get us to do here? Um, that was super helpful as well. Um, and because we we're all pretty strong leaders, we really had to take into account our followers' needs because we all wanted to ensure that um, group members wanted to be involved and were involved. And so as well as ensuring we recognized each other's um, needs as followers and leaders, we also took into account the strengths that each of us had and how they could help us create a better overall project and group as well. And so one reading that we can relate our experiences to was the reading Get on the Balcony. Um, this relates to our work so far because we had to remember that we are all equally intelligent and we all have good ideas, no matter our gender or other such differences, even just like our different ways of working through things or um, some of us tended to get stuff done a little bit quicker than others, but it wasn't that, you know, other people weren't putting in as much work. It was just also our different schedules and everything. And so getting on the balcony is really important to ensure that we are all engaged and we all feel welcome within the group. It's pretty easy to get frustrated working within a group where everyone has different opinions and different methods of doing things. Um, so taking that step back and acknowledging these differences and realizing that your group members are probably also feeling frustrated with these inefficiencies of the group um, really helps to move forward. You're just another member of the group. Once you take that step back, you can kind of realize that. Um, and once you have all of that out of the way, it really helps you figure out how to use each of these differences and these different styles to accomplish the assignments and move on and do a good job um, with group work.